Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Rafe. I work at Etsy on data stuff mostly, but I'm kind of a general purpose software engineer. Uh, and I'm kind of kind of talk about uh, what we do to Scalecraft at Etsy. Uh, there are a ton of presentations about Etsy on SlideShare, uh, a lot of information about kind of what we do DevOps-wise and all these other things. Uh, so I decided not to talk about that, and because we only have 20 minutes, I skipped all my usual intros. So I'm just jumping straight into the uh, to the content. So uh, when I started thinking about this, I started thinking about what is craft, what is manufacturing, heavy industry, all these things, and. Uh, and so I want to kind of jump into that quickly first. And I think what we usually think about is handcrafted treasures versus mass-produced crap, right? Um, and and uh, in America, this is the company we always think about when we think about mass production, which is Walmart, uh, or places like the dollar store. Uh, I heard it's a pound shop in the UK. Um, right, they make uh, cheap stuff or sell cheap stuff that's, that's kind of made in a shoddy way, and this represents uh, mass production. Uh, James already stole my obvious example, obvious counterexample, which is Apple. They're cranking out tens of millions of high-quality iPhones every quarter. Uh, another example of mass production, of course, is like this Italian luxury motorcycle. Uh, again, these things are mass-produced, uh, but the level of, if not craft, at least quality is very high. Um, and again, when we talk about when we talk about craft items, uh, this is a $1,000 handmade Japanese chef's knife that you can buy on Etsy. It's absolutely beautiful. It's made by a Japanese uh, master knife maker. He's selling his stuff. This desk is handmade by Chicago Design Studio. Again, it's 4300 bucks on Etsy, and it's a one-of-a-kind work of art. Uh, but there's, of course, uh, you know, more to craft than that as well. These cakes are handcrafted, and I think they're cute, but uh, they don't, they're not particularly awesome looking. Or, you know, Here's a famous handcrafted item, the logo for the 2012 Olympic Games. Uh, they probably paid a lot of money for it. It didn't go over particularly well. Uh, so my point here is that really craft and mass production are, are somewhat value neutral, uh, and they're more of an artifact of kind of the scale of the business that is the scale of the business rather than, uh, you know, what people set out to do. When you're bigger, you, you have to do more industrial things. So instead, I tried to think about what are these things really about? And Craft maximizes the skill and creativity of the individual artisan. So when you're working by yourself in a room, it's as good as you want it to be, as good as you have time for it to be, uh, and as good as you can make it, right? The Japanese master knife maker is going to make this absolutely gorgeous knife. If I go to my garage and say, I'm going to make a chef's knife for myself, it's probably not even going to be sharp. Um, and in turn, mass production optimizes for predictability and reliability. Given a set of inputs, your goal is to uh, predict what's going to come out of it, regardless of who's working on it, regardless of how many people you hired this week, uh, regardless of the weather. It's factoring out all those things and, uh, and trying to make something, something great at a pretty large scale. And uh, so on the other side, of course, what's the problem with mass production? It can make us into faceless drones. Nobody wants to have a job like this where you stand at an assembly line every day and do the same thing over and over. I mean, it's probably a better job than some people have, but again, I think we strive for more, if nothing else. Uh, I think the dangers of craft are a little more subtle, and uh, they basically boil down to something I saw on Twitter the other day, which is that heroism doesn't scale. So this man's name is Husto Thomas. He's a fish butcher at Le Bernardin Restaurant in New York, and uh, his claim to fame is that he comes in at 7 o'clock every morning, he but butchers and portions all the fish for the restaurant for the day, and he's done at 2 p.m., and he goes home. It's about 700 pounds of fish. When he goes on vacation, uh, they have three other chefs at the restaurant do his work, and it takes them all day. So this completely doesn't scale. If they want to open La Berna down on the West Coast, they can't go out and say, hey, we're going to go hire the other Husto Thomas and have him be our fish butcher on the West Coast. Either he has to train someone, they have to come up with a new process. Uh, this guy is the best in the world at what he does, maybe, and, and he's the only one like that. That's why it's heroic. Uh, at this point, I want to stop and talk about the elephant in the room, which is that my business is software development, and it's not really like mass production or manufacturing uh, or craft either. It's sort of its own unique thing. Uh, the other day I wrote a backfill script for a database table, and like that was a unique handcrafted thing. I've written other scripts like it, but it required thought, uh, and that's what it is for like all software development. So to kind of apply that model to, to mass production versus craft, I thought about what software is, and what I find interesting about it is that it's both a set of instructions for a computer, basically you execute it, and it does stuff that's uh, you know very discreet, but it's also a document we write for other people. So on the hard part of writing software, it's not easy to write software that performs well or has few bugs, but it's also not right to not easy to write software that doesn't drive your coworkers crazy uh, or yourself crazy six months after you wrote it. So so I think my fundamental argument is going to be that 
uh, you can apply industrial practices to the aspects of software development that uh, are that are that are about operating the computer. But to write software that's good for the other people who also have to to work on it, uh, you have to use craft. And so. Uh, the question, of course, is how do we grow without forgetting craft? Uh, and specifically, how do we do that at Etsy? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Etsy approach to this. Um, and this is not a perfected formula. We're tweaking it all the time. But, but this, is the, this is kind of what we do. So here's the industrial parts first. And really, there are three things I'm going to talk about here, which is process monitoring, automation, and interchangeable parts. Uh, so at Etsy, we're pretty famous for measuring everything. We have tons of graphs. This is a, a throughput graph that shows how much business is being conducted on the site per second. And it's on the wall in our engineering office. We look at it all the time. And if you look on the right at the blue line, it dips way down there. Uh, it's because someone pushed a bug fix that made the database really slow. And uh, as you can see, you know, at the most basic level, what are we trying to do? Scale up to meet the basic requirements of our business. We failed for about 15 minutes the other day, uh, and it shows up on our throughput graph. Uh, again, what else do we graph? This is nothing new. We graph performance. These are the top five pages on the website. Uh, we have a service level for each one that's expected, and we measure them to make sure we're kind of meeting that service level. Uh, the third thing, the third thing we go through is uh, is process monitoring uh, is exceptions. So again, this is nothing new. You do it in industry. You do it in software development. Uh, we have an expected level of errors on the website, just like if you had an assembly line, you'd expect if you make you know, 10,000 iPhones, you'd have to throw 50 or 100 away. This is anticipated. Uh, so one, no one has the money to drive this error rate down to zero. And two, if some of these errors were at zero, what we would probably assume is that the site is down, not that things are working incredibly well. Uh, this is, so this is just kind of expected. You're always going to get 404s and things like that. Uh, this next slide is near and dear to my heart because I work on data, and it's A-B testing. It's a little bit different than, than some of the other process monitoring, but the point here is that deciding what to put on your website is a craft. You know, do we change the checkout process to make it easier? Do we make the listing images bigger on listing pages on the site? There are tons of things we could do. When we decide to do them, the question is, how do they work? And uh, you can answer that question with math and science, right? Uh, so we gather data, we do significance tests, all these other things. It's not guesswork, uh, and we don't have to have people kind of waste their time figuring it, trying to figure out, you know, hmm, what, what you know, just guessing, looking at numbers, we, we apply math to that. Uh, so then I'll move on to automation. Uh, and this is sort of what Etsy is famous for, is uh, continuous deployment. We push about 30 times a day, and, and our developers push on their very first day of work. So. Uh, and by push, I mean deploy code to the production site. So the, the key thing about this is that when you arrive at work on your first day as an Etsy engineer, there's a Linux virtual mach machine set up for you. It's a mirror of our production site with all the source code. You can immediately go in, start editing files. You have a URL where you can look at them, and then you can, uh, and you can make the code live. So, uh, and, and you can go through our push process. Uh, when we make changes to our production environment, those changes get shifted out to everyone's VMs. So we have this really high level of automation where developers don't have to worry about the basic twiddling that everyone else does. No one sends you an email and says, oh, hey, we're moving from PHP 5.3 to 5.4 this week. You need to recompile Apache on your VM or any of this other stuff. It just works. Uh, you, you know, when they push it in Chef, it's done, which is fantastic. Uh, it's funny, continuous integration, all of these things are fairly pedestrian these days, although Etsy's the only company I ever worked at that really did them well. Uh, but we have a continuous integration suite if you want to, uh, if you want to run tests on the site. Uh, you just type try into your VM, it starts up one of these build things, and it course runs unit tests and functional tests, uh, static analysis, style checks, all this other stuff. Uh, nothing incredibly novel about it, but it's a huge enabling technology in terms of uh, allowing people to get work done and feel pretty sure that what they're doing isn't breaking the stuff other people are doing. Um, Again, and so the, of course, the last thing is uh, deployment. We're a continuous deployment shop. It has to be really, really easy to deploy. It has to be uh, error free. We have an open source tool called Deployinator that does that. Uh, like our little Easter egg is I took this picture at night, so it looks like nighttime at the top. Normally it's orange. Uh, but the main thing about it is that we have two buttons. You push one button, and it pushes the code to the pre prod environment and launches all the tests. Uh, if all those tests pass and your manual tests go through, then you push the other button and it goes to the live website. It's uh, super easy. The hard part is more about coordinating all the developers who want to push at the same time. But even then, that's automated. Our deploys are atom uh, atomic, so it just works. Um, and finally, the last, uh, the last 
sort of industrial piece is interchangeable parts. And I kind of cheated on this one because it's not about making things out of interchangeable parts. At Etsy, it's more about the developers being interchangeable parts. Uh, and what I mean by that, like it sounds bad, but, but the point is that we really focus on keeping our stack super simple and uh, super homogenous. When we go to add a new thing to our technology stack, we uh, ask, what can it replace? And we try and build everything on the same, so it, oddly it's PHP, but we build everything in PHP. Uh, internal apps, external apps, they're all in the same repository. So uh, if I want to go out and make new features on any product at the company almost, I can do it regardless of which team I work on. So it's really, it lowers the friction between uh, teams, helps people learn from each other, uh, and it's, it's an interesting aesthetic choice when you talk about companies that are building everything around services and stuff like that, but it works really well for us. So uh, the next, uh, so now I'm going to jump to the crafty parts. Um, and I think Etsy has this reputation, you know, we have this cool logo, Code is Craft, we, our engineering blog is Code is Craft, we take craft very seriously. But I really had to sit down and think, what does craft really mean in terms of software development at Etsy? And I think, I think what it, at the core, it's about making everybody more heroic, right? So, uh, you know, you have, some you have some developers that just got out of school. You have some developers who've been at it 15 years. Some are savants. Some are, you know, good, but not great. And so how to make them all better. This is what craft is about, uh, and I think in a growing organization anyway. Uh, so again, none of these things are incredibly unusual, but, you know, starting in 2012, we really took, started taking code reviews really seriously. Um, oddly, this is automated too. You just have to type review in your working branch and it creates this review for you. Uh, but what's nice about code reviews is if you use them pervasively, is that one, uh, the people getting their code reviewed learn obviously if they get good reviews, so you know, they, they write better code. Two, the people who are doing the reviews really benefit. They're looking at code written by other people, they're thinking about it, they're in a discussion of what makes it better. This is sort of how a group gets better at their craft. And I think three, the, the most uh, kind of subtle effect it has is that it gets everybody kind of um, familiar with both giving and receiving constructive criticism. I think one of the tough things for engineers if they're not used to it is to hear, hey, your code could be better this way or this could be done differently or to tell other people that. It can be intimidating to tell some guy who's, you know, a gray beard, uh, you know, this code, mm, probably inefficient or I don't really understand it. And uh, having a context to do that I think really helps. Um, at a little bit less granular level, we do boot camps. They're not this kind of boot camp. Uh, nor are they this kind of boot camp. Although, oddly, we have a thing called Sweatsy on Thursdays where people do this kind of boot camp. Um, uh, I don't participate. But uh, they're really kind of more like this, the, the sort of eco-tourism tour of the jungle. When you start at Etsy, you spend less than a week usually with your team, and then you go on three or four uh, boot camps with other teams to work on small projects. Uh, and Obviously, you meet new people and you kind of learn your way around the code base, but you also get a sense of the larger engineering culture at Etsy uh, outside your own team. Like, it, it again, prevents this sort of silo thing where it's like I have the data team and we do things this way and the people on the storefronts team do things some other way. Uh, most people have seen more than one team or pretty much all of them, so they sort of get a general sense of what it's all about, uh, which works out, which works really well. So much so that uh, we find that people ask to go on boot camps whenever they're between projects. You know, they say, oh, I want to go build some stuff with dev tools for a couple of weeks. Uh, in e-commerce, this is something I didn't know until I worked at Etsy, like you don't touch the site between roughly the beginning of October and the end of the year. So all the, people's who, all the people who work mostly on customer facing stuff uh, kind of boot camp through the end of the year to have interesting things to do when they couldn't work on the features that they normally work, uh, that they normally work on. And this year we're formalizing it even more so that every engineer who's been there at least a year has one boot camp this year, uh, with the goal being one, again, to let people learn from each other and get to know new people, and two, to make sure that their teams aren't so reliant on them that they can't do without them for a month. Uh, kind of this uh, single point of failure insurance, I heard someone call it uh, at work the other day. And so another new thing that we just started about two weeks ago is bug rotation. Uh, Etsy, probably like most other uh, large app software applications, has tons of non-critical uh, bugs that have never been fixed. And uh, rather than sort of leaving them on the team that built the products, uh, for features that are not in active development, they just go into this big queue, and then every developer spends about one day a month on bug rotation with their other bug rotators. Uh, and they just pull bugs from this queue and work on them. So again, it's more about spreading the craft through the organization. You're working on code you don't normally work on. You're meeting engineers you don't normally uh, meet. And of course, it's liberating to these teams to know that they don't have 150 unfixed bugs in their queue that they're eventually going to get to someday, which never actually happens. 
Uh, at my old company, we had hundreds of bugs like that, even though we were one-tenth the size of Etsy. And uh, yeah, we just never fixed them. So I think this is an improvement on that. And it's funny, we had this pretty large number of bugs in the queue uh, at the beginning, only two weeks ago, and the team is just, and the bug rotators are just burning through them. So it'll be interesting to see what the fate is of bug rotation in about April or May when they fixed all the outstanding bugs. Uh, we might have to take a hiatus. Maybe it'll be bug rotation in the spring next year. Um, and so kind of last on the, on the general craftsmanship front, uh, is code reading. We have a kind of book club code reading group at Etsy. One person picks some code. Thus far, no one has picked any code from Etsy. Uh, this is uh, backbone.js. It was the subject of our first code reading group. Uh, and everyone reads the, everyone goes off, reads the code, has a couple of weeks to do so. And then we sit down and have a book club type discussion, like what's good about this code? What do we like about it? What would we do differently? Uh, how would you refactor it? Uh, and it, it's really been beneficial. I think it's really interesting to see, you know, it gives the kind of more senior people a chance to, to talk in an informal setting with people who are less senior. Everyone kind of gets their ideas on the table and it really works well. So this is sort of, this is the uh, basic craft idea at Etsy. And uh, when I practiced this at work, we had a person who just started last week and she, uh, this is her first real software development job. And so she said kind of, she didn't say what's the counterfactual, but she said, uh, like, what's different about this than what everybody else in the industry does, right? I mean, it seems to make sense. So is it vastly different? And when I thought to pin it down to one thing, I think when people scale their organizations, you can either kind of do what Etsy has done, which is scale up the, the industrial automation parts of it, or you can scale up your process, which is kind of what we did at my old company. And uh, scaling up in the process terms is just, I think, deadly to a software to a software company that really wants to focus on craft, that wants to build cool things. Uh, people spend more and more of their times in process and less time doing the stuff that they really love doing. Uh, so I, th I think kind of to wrap it up, uh, you know, every business that's growing eventually starts to look more like this, which is a Ford factory from the early uh, 20th century. But, but I think that for developers, you know, they always want to feel like they're working more in an environment like this, right? Like I'm in my workshop, I'm building something I love uh, with a lot of care. And so uh, I think the Etsy formula for kind of creating that situation is, uh, you measure everything that, be, that can be quantified so you don't have to spend time uh, thinking about, you know, does this work, does it not. You automate every process that doesn't actually involve craftsmanship. Always better to automate processes than sort of impose them. Uh, and then with all the time you save, you use it instead to spread the values of craft through your organization. So rather than having developers doing more tests that could be done by uh, continuous integration suite or having people trying to figure out, you know, querying databases to figure out how things are performing, that stuff's all taken care of. Instead, we can spend more time on code reviews and this other stuff that's really valuable. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, Rafe Colburn, you, we have an engineering blog, codescraft.etsy.com. Thanks.